Hey man, this has been super fun, this series has. I know in the summer we have a lot of vacations, a lot of things going on, and uh, I see you. I see you on Facebook all over the place. So uh, I know you've been traveling, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of fun, but thankful that you're here today for uh, our, C, uh, our series and message number three in the Leisure Days series. We've been talking about the importance of rest. The underlying theme of the whole series has been on the theology of rest, what the Bible teaches us about rest, what rest really is from God's perspective. And uh, so we have been uh, taking a look at that. And today I want to talk to you about an alarming aspect, uh, which is the, what happens uh, when we don't rest. And we're going to talk about unrested regrets. Unrested regrets is kind of the title of our message and kind of where we're going today. A couple of passages that we're reading, Exodus chapter 20, if you want to turn there, the 20th chapter of Exodus, we're going to look in a moment at verse 8 through 11. And then we have a New Testament one in Mark chapter 6. I'll repeat that, Exodus chapter 20 and the Gospel of Mark chapter 6. Who has Exodus chapter 20? What page is it on for us in your Bible? 70. Hey, you know, I, I had I thought of something funny today. So you know how, like, when I was growing up, and uh, this is this is bad. There was a, a lot more people were, uh, you know, young young people were smoking. And so what I would hear fairly commonly, you know, uh, locker rooms around, you know, was after uh, school and stuff, and and during uh, class between classes and stuff, somebody coming up to someone else saying, "Can I bum a cigarette?" You know. So this morning I thought it'd be funny if, you know, if you didn't bring your Bible, if you just turned to a neighbor and say, can I bum a Bible? So you just bum, bum a. Exodus chapter 20. It was funnier in my head, I guess. <laughs> and uh, then Mark chapter 6. Okay, Exodus chapter 20. Let's, let's start the reading there in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son, or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals. Um, I avoided the King James Version because it said neither your ox or your ass. All right. <laughs> the story of Balaam. <laughs> Nor any of your foreign, uh, foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Mark chapter 6, if you have that in, uh, held out of the New Testament, you want to go there with us and let's read that, look at that together. Mark chapter 6, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were many, uh, there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. My granddaughter Allie has a, a favorite movie, and uh, well, she has several, but one that for a long time was at the top of her list was the movie Sing. How many of you have seen Sing before? So she loved this movie, and there are a number of different animal characters uh, that there is kind of a, like a, an America's Most Talented kind of thing they're putting together that sing, and they're outstanding. You know, they just do an amazing job, all of these different animals, okay? And so she really has learned the songs, and she belts it out to full strength, you know, as much as she can, uh, as much as she can uh, understand and repeat. And she uh, loves singing these songs, but there's one song uh, that it's a big band song that was originally recorded many years ago by Frank Sinatra. And uh, in the movie, it's sang by a mouse. You can imagine the big voice of this mouse singing, I did it my way. 
And I was thinking about that song. There is a line in there that all of us wish was true. You know, a little section of this song that we all wish was true. But in our heart of hearts, we know it's not true for us. And it's likely not true for anybody else around us. And that line reads this way. Regrets, I've had a few. I think I can think of more than a few in my own life. But then again, too few to mention. Man, don't we wish that was true. I have so few regrets in my life that it's not even worth mentioning. You know, my life has pretty, been pretty stellar, you know. So it's not even worth talking about the few places I slipped. I made a mistake once in 1971, okay. But after that, things have gone fairly smoothly. So it says, regrets I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do and saw it through without exemption. It's a section of that song that all of us listen to and we wish that that could be said of our lives or of any life that we know, that there are too few regrets to even bother to mention, that we took charge of our life, we went forward with it in terms of what we, how we were created, how we were made, how we were designed, and we, we did what we were supposed to do, and now at the finish of life we stand there, you know, like, uh, like uh, the, the, the uh, statue in Philadelphia of, of the champion boxer, you know, Rocky, and he's, and you know, we did it our way, and we won, and we're wearing the championship belt, and we're just ready to exit life and go meet Jesus and just give him a big high five, right? Because everything was so cool, but for most of us we know that's not the real story. I want to talk to you as we open this up about four things that doctors have said medically happen to us when we don't rest or that we are in danger of. And it really, these are, I think, things that uh, are advantages of getting rested, what will happen in your body and in your life, okay? This one kind of, uh, all four of these surprise me uh, a little bit. This one in particular, quite a bit. Do you know that if you rest, you, have, uh, you will get an improved memory. So the science behind that is that lack of rest can, can make it difficult to concentrate and to retain information. And, and when you rest, what happens is that your brain goes through all of the activities and the impressions of the day and the important memory information and files everything and gets it put where it's supposed to go. And so that when you wake up, your memory is better when you have actually taken the time to rest appropriately and get the kind of rest that you need to get. The second one was that you maintain a healthy weight. This was another big surprise, right? What would rest have to do? You know, we, we think about exercise, we think about eating right. But here's the science behind that. Rest uh, and metabolism are controlled by the same area of the brain. And rest releases hormones that control appetite. And here's what researchers found at the University of Chicago. They found that dieters who were well-rested lost more fat than dieters who did not. Those who followed the same regiments had basically the same kind of metabolism breakdown. They, they were better uh, to lose fat when they were rested and, and well taken care of. The third was uh, heart health. In 2010, uh, a study found that C uh, minus uh, re reactive protein, a C minus reactive protein, which is associated with heart attacks and risk, was higher in people who got six or fewer hours of sleep a night. Six or fewer hours of sleep a night. And of course, the fourth one is one that we have known for quite a while, and that is that proper rest uh, reduces stress in our life. So the stress levels come down. We, we have less stress. We're overall, we're, we are uh, healthier, and we make better decisions when we are rested and we're a little more stress-free. Bonnie Ware was a, uh, is a, a nurse who moved from the practice of, of nursing in a hospital to uh, practicing uh, her skill sets uh, at hospice. And so uh, she has spent a number of years there and she wrote a book out of her experience there. Over a 10 year period, she interviewed patients uh, to see what they had, uh, if they had regrets. And there are five that surfaced with uh, these patients over a 10 year period of time. I only want to hit on just two of them with you to talk about regrets that these patients said they had in their life 
um, that they, if they had a chance to go back and redo things, they would live differently in two primary areas. The number one one was they said, I wish I pursued my dreams and aspirations and not the life others expected of me. I wish I had pursued my dreams, my ambitions, my aspirations, and not the life that others expected of me. The second one I think would not surprise you. Uh, this came up uh, always, uh, number one or number two, with every person. In fact, with male patients, uh, later she says in the book that this was one that was always, every male she ever interviewed said this one along with some of the others. And that is that I wish I didn't work so hard. It's primarily because for women, uh, not all of them in their, in their age range were always breadwinners. So uh, the men had this regret at the top primarily because they were uh, coming out of the generation of being the breadwinners. And what I thought about when I looked at this is how we live on the two extremes in life. That we are either trying to please others with our life or we are trying to please ourselves. And we can never find a healthy balance of rest. We're always trying to please others or we're always trying to please ourselves. And it leads to this unrested life that leads us down a pathway of having great regrets. And it's not only at the end of life that I have met people who have these regrets. These regrets that we're talking about now in counseling sessions, I've heard from people in their late 20s and late 30s and 40s and 50s. People who are living without rest, people who are not entering to the rest that God has provided, have these kind of regrets because their lives are being stretched out in one direction or another. They're trying to please everyone or they're trying to please themselves. And both of those masters are very cruel and we're incapable of it. In the end, we discover that what we really have is a wasted life. Both of these choices drive us to exhaustion and both eliminate resting in God's finished work, as we talked about earlier in these messages. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. They missed out on their children's youth. They did not grow in their relationship with their spouses at an equal pace. They missed out on friendship opportunities. They missed out just really getting their bodies physically rested for the things that were ahead of them that they didn't even know and weren't prepared for. Women also expressed regrets in this same area, as we said a moment ago, because they were not the primary breadwinners that didn't come up number one for them all the time. I wish I had the courage to have lived a life true to who I am rather than a life that was lived to please everyone else. The courage to be who God created you to be. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew. In Christ Jesus, so that we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. You were designed by God. You were a masterpiece work of him. His, and he has a purpose and a mission and a plan for your life. And living outside of rest is a life that leads us to live unrested and outside of our purpose, outside of our mission that God has planned for us. Rest includes, real rest when we define it, includes all of these components. Mental rest, spiritual rest, emotional rest, physical rest. And into that God spoke, remember the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. There are four things that rest that God has provided, the theology of rest, does for us and helps us to understand. And so I want to clip through these and, and, and uh, if you're taking notes, write these down. Four things that rest will do for us when we're resting in God. Number one, rest is first and foremost God's design. God knew that, that we would need rest, and so he built rest into creation's order. 
You know, when we see God resting on the seventh day, it isn't because He's tired. He built it into the order of creation. God says, this is so important that I am going to model a day for you of resting, something that you need to understand and adopt into your life. Secondly, rest fuels our ministry and it prevents burnout. It fuels our ministry and it prevents burnout. We can go at a pace, even as ministers and pastors, Michelle and I, over these many years of ministry, have seen so many ministers' homes break down and fall apart because they, they, put, they put doing ahead of being. And they were so committed and they thought that everything was on their backs and that they had to carry the church and, and do everything. And they sacrificed and they gave and they gave and they gave. And as their, their marriages progressed, they began to lose sight of each other. They lose sight of what was really important in life, lose sight of the journey that God had provided for them. And, and they separated, they, they, they divorced, they, they, uh, they had, fr- had fractured relationships because... Even in ministry, we need rest. Rest fuels our ministry. It prevents burnout. And into that, Jesus said to his disciples, you remember we read a moment ago in Mark chapter 6, then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Jesus wasn't saying to them, we're more important than the rest of these guys. Let's, let's take off, all right? Let's go just talk us guys stuff, you know. Let's hang out. Jesus was saying, if we keep staying here, we're going to get shredded. And pretty soon we're going to lose the connection that we need to have in, in relationship. And we're going to, we're going to begin to, uh, to get fractured, to get frustrated. We're so t- out, of, out of your tiredness, you're going to become, as I talked about last week, one of those pants, cranky pants, angry pants, guys. And you're not going to be doing effective ministry any longer. Come on, guys, let's pull aside, let's rest. Jesus told the disciples on another occasion something that doesn't sound very Jesus-like. A woman comes in and, and uh, breaks a bottle of expensive perfume, uh, anoints Jesus' feet, and, and begins to wash his feet, and then dries it with her hair. And there were some of the disciples over the doorways thinking, you know, she could have used water or something else. That's very expensive perfume. We could have taken that, sold it, and given it to the poor. Jesus overhears this and says something not very Jesus-like. The poor you will have with you always. What? What he was saying is, because of sin, people have set themselves up for destruction. You're not going to eradicate poverty. You're not going to eradicate need. Why? Because people are choosing things that will lead them to that. They're choosing that over Jesus. It's why we're as a church to call them, uh, you know, to, we have this great mission to proclaim there's another way to live. You don't have to keep making bad choices that lead you to to destruction, that lead you to poverty. You don't have to have generations and generations of children who will live in poverty and it will decline over and over and over. Generations and generations of drug abuse, generations and generations of alcohol abuse. You don't have to have that. There's another way to live. It's putting Jesus first. It's living the life that he intended you to live. And so Jesus calls them aside and says, hey guys, they'll be here tomorrow, believe me. <laughs> their problems aren't going anywhere until they change their choices. So you, come on, let's go rest, let's eat, let's get refreshed, and then we'll come back. The third thing that rest will do is rest is a way to practice faith in God's sovereignty. Practice faith in God's sovereignty. Exodus chapter 20, on it, talking about the Sabbath, you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor your foreigner residing in towns. Man, why does Jesus keep building, or why does God keep building on this in, 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 this, in the language of this passage? Why does he keep building on this? Because every time he eliminates, have you ever gone into like, um, uh, in, in, in an airplane, you know, you go into the, uh, the restroom there and they have that smoke detector and it says, uh, do not tamper, um, do not 
dismantle. I mean, it goes through this litany of things, right, that you can't do. Don't touch it. Don't breathe on it. Don't think about it. <laughs> right? It does that because we look for loops, don't we? We look for little exits. And, and so you've so you got somebody that really wants to smoke, and they say, well, I didn't tamper with it. I just took the battery out, right? <laughs> okay? I mean, and so they had to go, their lawyers had to sit down and, and put down this, this language that just builds and builds and builds because we're looking for exits, and that's what God's doing. He's saying... You are not going to work. Your servants are not going to work. Well, this is just, it was just the oxen. They were just pulling the plow. I, I wasn't there. You know, I was just kind of uh, sitting on the porch drinking some lemonade while they were just plowing. You know, it wasn't uh, Every once in a while, I would go out there and tell them to turn and go this direction. You see, you know, this is human nature, isn't it? It's like we're looking for a way out. And God says, no way. You're not working. No way. You are resting. This is all about rest. And I'm calling you to rest. So he says... He builds on that in this, in this language. Not your, you know, foreigners can't. I mean, there's nobody. It's, there's no work. This is a day of worship. It's a day of rest. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that are in them, but rested on the Sabbath day. So the second half of this verse is about, the first half of this verse is about you are not doing anything. And it's like, well, if I don't do anything, nothing's going to get done. And the second half of this verse is God saying, I've done it. I created it all. Everything you need to survive. I created the air you're breathing. I created. The fish you're eating for dinner in the sea. I created. Everything you need. I created. I took it. I finished it. It was good. You just sat down and recognized there's a day to celebrate me. In the finished work that is there for you and to rest yourself. Because all of your running and doing and being is, is exhaustion and it's not accomplishing anything. I've finished it. The fourth thing is rest reconnects us with our most important relationships. Going back to that passage in Mark chapter 6, he said, uh, to his disciples, remember, he pulls them aside, and, and, the, and the scripture says he said this because there were so many people coming and going. Jesus' apostles didn't even have time to eat. Jesus wanted his disciples to get reconnected with each other, uh, to be fed, to get encouraged, to get rested, to tell their stories to one another and be encouraged that they were on target, they were on mission. Uh, be strengthened. That's what we do when we come together as a church, isn't it? We get, we get fed. Spiritually speaking, we get encouraged. We get uplifted. We're happy to be here. We're energized when we go out of here. We know, you know where we are on mission or where we need to make course corrections and that kind of thing. And when we get connected, what happens uh, as a result of that is that we get refreshed, we get rebuilt, and we get renewed. That's what happens when we come together and we get connected. We get refreshed. And we heard these testimonies uh, today from these kids. That sets your heart on fire, doesn't it? You know, somebody saying, I'd slipped away from God. I was losing track of, of uh, you know, uh, why it would even be important and, and coming back, you know, and getting to go to this camp and, and hear God's word spoke and pray with my friends. I really realized how important this is and how much I love Jesus and Man, you know, those are awesome, aren't they? And, and we, can't, we can't hear those anywhere else except we come together and we get refreshed and we get rebuilt and we get renewed. You see, sin has made the earth prickly. Say to your neighbor, prickly. <laughs> it's enlarged its brambles. Now the best that the world has to offer, feather down pillows, friendship, a juicy steak with a baked potato. It's all affected in some way by the curse of sin. Brambles. And it's become prickly in our lives. Even work doesn't work as God originally intended it to work. The fall skewed what once was good, what God had designed for good. Adam was working and not even sweating. You know, I mean, he was being refreshed, he was being renewed. 
But now we have unrested regrets. We are working ourselves into the ground. And so our sticky statement for today, and every time we give you the sticky statement, is really the sermon in a sentence. And so if you remember this, if you write this down, if you remember this, you probably can preach this sermon to somebody else, right? And they, you can share it with them. Here it is. Regrets lead to I wish I had. Rest leads to I am thankful I did. Regrets lead to I wish I had. Rest leads to I am thankful I did. God has provided rest for all who are weary. The Bible tells us that He invites us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And once we get to this point in the message, we go, okay, you've convinced me. Where do I sign up? How do I get uh, it to enter into God's rest? What things do I need to do? That's the first thing we always think of, you know. All right, I'll get my pick and shovel. What do I need to do? Where do I start digging? How do I get into this rest thing? You know, because it sounds pretty good. And you may remember that we began this message by kind of defi defining what the Sabbath is. So the easiest way for me to explain for you the starting point of how we do this is to go back and just remind you that Sabbath means to cease, to stop working. The rest of God is where your work ends and God's work begins. The rest of God is where your work ends and where God's work begins. So what do you need to do? Here it is. Stop trying to help him do what he does. <laughs> Stop responding out of fear. We talked about last week, when I am afraid, I will put my trust in him. Stop being driven by being afraid. We said, you know, last week that the reason that we do a lot of what we do is we, you know, if I come up to you and say, well, why don't you slow your life down? You know, why don't you work less? Why don't you spend more time with your family? You said, well, I'm afraid if I do that, fill in the blank. I may not have my job. I'm afraid if I don't take the kids to all the ball games all year long, everything they want to do, that they will I'm afraid if I don't give in and, and run them all over town where they want to go and, and do those things that they will, what? Fill in the blank. And God says, stop worrying. Stop helping me. Stop. Stop. Start trusting me. Start believing me. Start resting in me. Look what happens when we rest in God's finished work, as we talked about earlier. We lower and even eliminate stress factors. We have better hearts. We have better memories. We have better weight. What would happen if we would honestly say, at the end of our lives, be able to say, I did it God's way. <laughs> How would that change our life? The Sabbath was never given to us by God as a suggestion. It was given to us by God as a command. A command that we have broken and broken and broken and broken. And the results of it have been so costly. We have broken homes, rebellion in families, divorce, drug abuse, physical illness, spiritual starvation, shortcuts that lead to corruption, injustice. Destructive trade-offs, gifts that we try to give to replace time not spent. I know I wasn't able to come to your concert, but here's a basketball. Here's golf clubs. Here's a dollhouse. Worship team, if you'd come. Would you invite a regular Sabbath into your life and model it for your family if you're married and would you invite a regular Sabbath into your life? So that your life is not filled with regret at those key points throughout your life, but instead is filled with thanksgiving. I'm thankful, grateful for the life that God has given. Grateful that I said yes to rusting and spending time with my family. I can never get that back. Every time we get a chance to spend some time uh, with our granddaughter, you know, it's, it, it, 
energizes me, it encourages me, it's so much fun, but I, I also recognize that those moments that are there, that, are, that arise, are, I can't get them back. So I don't say no. I mean, it's so rare if I ever say no, if, if you know, they call and say, hey, you know, can you watch uh, Allison for you know, uh, a little while, a couple hours or something, we have to go do this or that or something else. I don't say no because I recognize I'm never gonna get those back again, you know? At that age and that time and those moments, I wanna say yes. I was talking to my brother this last week, and they've been going through some things as a church. He's been going through some things as a pastor, and that was an inspiration for him. He says, you know, uh, Alan, he says, God's just really dealt with me about not saying no. And so many opportunities have arisen since I've started saying yes to God when he presents these. And as these opportunities come up to enjoy people, to rest, to, to do the things that uh, God is presenting, he said, I'm saying yes to them. And God's not only resting us, but he's also doing some amazing things financially for us. He's doing some amazing things in our church spiritually. In the last uh, seven weeks, they baptized five. Wow. Five people. And he said, I, I credit it to saying yes to God, yes to uh, the opportunities and things he brings into our lives, and trusting him, not carrying the burden for the longest time, he said, I felt like I was shouldering the burden of the church and financially, and we've had a lot of hits against us and different things that have happened, and their finances have taken a real uh, dent. But he says, I've just said, God, whatever you bring, I'm going to say yes to you. And it's just been marvelous to say yes to God, and yes to entering into his rest, yes to allowing him to do what he does best. I want you to stand with me. They're going to sing one of my favorite songs. It's a new song, um, maybe for some of you, maybe some of you have heard, Shane and Shane, but uh, I love this song. Man, let's rejoice and worship the Lord. And today, let's say, God, I'm making a commitment to enter into the rest. I am not going to try to make things happen. I'm going to stop. I'm going to get off your chair and let you do it.